Okay, hi, I, I'm Matthias. Uh, I'm from the Android Systems team based in London. And uh, yeah, this is, a, is actually a joint talk with Juliano, but Juliano is not, not here today, but he's on chat um, and he is um, very responsive to uh, any questions that you have, might, uh, might have in chat. Um, and arguably, he's also much more proficient on some of the things I'm talking about. Um, so we are talking yet another time about ABI monitoring. Um, uh, AI monitoring the kernel and a bit beyond. Um, so what are we doing actually? We are the Android systems team at Google and um, we care about the Linux kernel and Android. Uh, we care about um, a generic kernel image, uh, means a single binary for all the devices, um, reducing uh, fragmentation of, um, of kernels. We also care about uh, a bunch of system libraries, components, and lower level uh, stuff um, that I'm not going into the, too much detail right now. And we have a growing tooling team that cares about um, stability of, of, of the artifact that we are producing, that we are releasing, like the kernel itself. Um, if you are wanting to guarantee anything that is related to ABI stability or um, general stability for that matter for production device that runs of billions on devices, um, we should really do hard. Uh, or really should uh, do a good job to keep it stable to a chain and everything. Um, so why do we care um, about ABIs? Is we, as opposed to what the kernel does upstream, um, we actually try to guarantee some API and ABI stability between the kernel and the, the modules which is not something that the, the kernel upstream wants and also not something that we want to try to achieve. Um, but within boundaries, um, like same compiler, same configuration, same LTS, um, there is some stability uh, guarantee that you can give um, within releases, um, such that uh, the generic kernel image, the VM Linux for that matter, can be uh, exchanged independently of uh, vendor modules, um, just based on the ABI contract. Um, we also do user space monitoring these days, increasingly in AOSP for Android libraries, um, like improving their um, like stability for, for ABIs and the NDK. That's fairly recent um, and soon to be properly landed. And yeah, as as the, as the, the mission line at the bottom says, uh, we want to capture ABI API surfaces, or we want to capture breakages of them and detect changes um, uh, at build time, um, such that they not become an, an issue at, at runtime. So the, the, the line between ABI and API is a bit blurry. Um, often things you can detect from an API change that is relevant, um, that leaks into an, what you would traditionally call ABI. Um, I think most of the people in this room know what an ABI, what, what an ABI refers to, uh, and it, it remains blurry. So I just skip over this slide and um, um, just talk about what is the actual process behind often. Um, um, traditionally, if you, if you do things at build time, you build, first of all, a binary. It, uh, these days it comes with, um, usually with, with dwarf type information uh, and ELF, for example, symbol tables. And you extract, um, uh, you, you have a baseline binary, you have a candidate binary, like uh, for example, with the proposed patch, you extract type information or symbol and type information and get to a representation and then you compare them. Um, fairly simple process, but um, the, yeah, it, the difficulties in the detail, um, what do you extract from? Dwarf is one input, um, more recently CTF is an input, um, it's an effort that we are um, looking at very closely. Um, BTF as another uh, input that we experimented with and that which is basically the motivation for the whole project that we are starting. Um, obviously, it's not as easy as just extract type information. Dwarf is um, yeah, special in many ways and particularly not made for uh, monitoring ABIs. Um, um, CTF has has some sort of solution for that, um, or like goes a, goes a long way on, on making it much more um, suitable for that case. 
yet we are not having access to CTF so easily um, because we are a clang build, clang, we, are, we have a clang based build that does not natively produce CTF um, as for example um, the GCC does. Um, as for comparison of reporting, it's mostly yeah, comparing them and reporting any differences, which is um, which seems again um, trivial or at least not that difficult, but it's um, surprisingly hard um, to get actionable feedback out of a report um, that uh, the developer can actually make use of and, 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 and understand what kind of code change subtly introduced an ABI difference. Um, a big acknowledgement, of course, to LibAbigail, which we um, used in the very beginning. Um, and it is still the de facto monitoring tool for anybody um, um, doing ABI monitoring for distributions, for kernels, um, obviously open source, actively maintained, uh, almost daily uh, changes go in. Um, it, is, uh, it has a broad compiler language and, um, and, and packaging support. Um, and, and it's largely available in, in distributions. Um, we used ABIDW, which is the extraction tool, until Android 13. Uh, and we used the, the diffing tool um, that, that comes with it uh, until Android 12. Um, why we are not using it anymore um, and what the motivation is there um, will come next. But it doesn't, uh, doesn't say that the tools are not suitable, they are still suitable. But we, we at some point started experimenting with other things and found alternative al approaches that particular for the use case that we have worked quite well. Um, yeah, and, and LibAbigail does, does more. It can, can like literally download um, Fedora or Red Hat packages, um, unpack them, compare complete ABIs, things that um, the tooling that we are working on um, might or might never really support or support in very different ways. So like we, we don't make any promises and we, we, are, we are not also like pursuing the, uh, the way of um, comparing uh, whole distributions at this point, but it doesn't mean we, we couldn't in the future. Okay, how, how, how do we get to like, why, why, why do we something new? Why do we do something new? Um, it all started with, um, I think, a, it was a Facebook microblog site that spoke about an algorithm to take Dwarf using um, uh, effectively PA hole to create a BTF type, uh, BTF type information. And it was kind of showing off that uh, 124 MB Dwarf uh, relevant could be compressed or like could be um, represented in 1.5 MB BTF. And um, and it was at this time because we can transform dwarf via PA hole to um, to BTF. It was not limited for us um, to any tool chain, so we could actually use it. So uh, we postulated an intern project to say how, how maybe we can use BTF in the long run, because it, you can embed it in the uh, in the in the production binary even. So you can do ABI monitoring on the production binary where dwarf often is um, stripped off because of its size. Um, and BTF had some some like some some properties that are um, like the way it was structured and the way PA hole um, already deduplicated types and it was quite suitable to to ingest. So we started um, and and under like try to understand how can we use the BTF format, how can we represent it internally, uh, and one led to to the other. Like okay, we have a BTF reader uh, and we have an internal representation that is fairly close to what um, BTF represents itself as a binary format. And there was like, okay, how hard can it be to, based on that, <laughs> how hard can it be um, to create a comparison algorithm? Why is comparison of ABIs inherently hard? Um, and so within this couple of months of intern project, we actually came fairly fairly far and from from, uh, from from nothing to a BTF reader that could do some uh, preliminary um, uh, comparisons, even of the kernel. And we were surprised how, how well this whole format like reads, represents, and how, how well it can be used for, for comparisons as well. Um, but then we realized, okay, there, there are more problems to comparison um, cycles for example, um, 
this is this is clearly not a an, um, a DAG. This is a, a like a comp usually a very complicated graph with with cycles, and so we wanted to understand like how can we do comparison algorithms that um, are actually sustainable in the long run, like can deal with really large graphs, really complicated graphs. Um, how can we uh, possibly create an algorithm that can be extended for other languages? Like at the moment, we, we started with BTF and BTF um, only supports C. It's like, how can we ex make a model that, that possibly can support C++ in the future, other languages? Um, how can we um, effectively create an algorithm that handles cycles? And how can we uh, avoid repeated comparisons? How can we minimize um, the number of comparisons that we actually have to do. Um, and so this, this is the, the huge credit to Giuliano who, who actually did all this um, deep research and, and understood um, and I think to this day much better understands uh, how SCC internally really, really works. Um, so we came up with um, a comparison graph SCC model, like strongly connected components model. Um, and so in the, in this model, we, we describe a graph with SCCs and within an SCC, if there's any change, um, it implies uh, any other node has also a change. Um, and based on that, that algorithm, we created a little library. So I'm not going into detail on SCC works. There's a, there's a huge document um, that, that describes the details. And I think it's, there's room for another hour of talk at least on how to uh, explain how that particularly works. Um, but we could actually create um, a library that in the end of months of research, um, it's like a couple hundred lines plus tests um, that you could facilitate in a tool like the BTF reader and the BTF diff tool um, to do comparisons um, based on SCCs, like uh, cycle aware comparisons um, with memorization and um, yeah, and, and basically recursive uh, comparisons. Um, we use the, the path-based strong component algorithm. Um, I think there's a Wikipedia link if you want to click. The slides are, uh, by the way, up, so you can actually um, um, open them and, and click these links. Um, and, and the SSC finder is a, is a library within, within the tooling that, that encapsulates all this logic so that the actual main code doesn't really have to deal with that. So for example, uh, why, there, why are there cycles? Um, for example, you have like a, something like a link at, like at list or like a self-referencing uh, data type. Um, and you, you see the, the cycle in the data structure immediately. And then if you put strongly components, uh, strongly connected components on them, you can see, okay, but if, if something within this realm of struct and changes and everything basically changes, but um, um, if you do, uh, if you, if you like, um, step down into, into foo, this is an entirely uh, different, um, different area of, of comparisons, um, but you only need to do um, the, the stepping down into foo and the other component ones. Okay, uh, then we had BTF diff, and then we said, how hard can it be um, to actually generalize this model a bit? So we have we have a, a graph structure, we have algorithms that can, uh, that can diff. Um, so we, we refactored the code a bit, um, made it separately. We have a separate reader. Uh, we had like that, that reads into graph structures. Um, we refactored our, our uh, monitoring or uh, reporting tool a bit to um, give different options for developers on how to report actually changes. Um, some more verbose, one, some more uh, actionable. Um, and at that point, we, we realized that the actual BTF reader is just a couple hundred of lines. So again, we thought, how hard can it be um, to write an, an XML reader for the libabigail format? And it turned out uh, using libxml, and uh, we, we are actually able to read uh, the C, uh, like um, libabigail XML that is produced by C code, or like based on C code, uh, fairly quickly. So um, then um, another a couple hundred lines later, and okay, it, it was a bit more work, but. Um, it was not uh, based on the, on the on the code that we had and the, the refactoring that we did. It wasn't too hard to to create that. And for a long time, ABIDW as an extraction mechanism that uh, still has the whole dwarf reader logic and everything in, 
uh, an SDG diff as a as a comparison logic with such a such a graph um, are algorithms um, that that we can just like put on top of them. For example, think of um, actually writing the native format as just a graph algorithm where where you basically say here's here's your algorithm and here's how you handle certain nodes. Go and um, uh, do your DFS through the graph and emit whatever is on the way. Um, so by by enabling um, almost arbitrary algorithms that that just have to implement interfaces, um, we get from from uh, like we suddenly get uh, a lot of functionality. For example, writing native formats um, or rewriting graphs or um, even just uh, computing names that look like C um, out of type information. Um, um, the, these kind of uh, things are all en encapsulated in, in like the SSC finder and, and components to actually apply algorithms to the entire graph um, cycle of error. Um, this is a bit of a use case, but I, I, I try to run through a demo uh, in a second. Um, some numbers of performance. Um, we, we, we have the approach of, produ of consuming all the dwarf there is. Um, um, as opposed to, for example, the Webbiger, where, where there is more incremental um, looking after the, the dice that are actually needed. Um, the, that's kind of a trade-off decision we did. But we can uh, currently, um, yeah, consume 18 million um, dice in like 18 seconds um, and produce 12 million um, SDG nodes. And then with deduplication and unific unification, we can actually reduce this to just uh, 45,000 SDG nodes. And then when it comes to reading and writing, this all becomes like a, a sub-second operation when we think of actually SDG nodes, writing and reading. Um, yeah. um, quick demo. Okay, let's see how this works. Um, so, uh, doo -doo -doo. so this is a, like, technically you can follow along. Um, so this is just um, um, like the the, the, uh, the the project cloned from upstream, um, and going there, um, building it quickly, so you can see that that's just like a CMake build, doing things, and yeah, in the end we end up with like. Binaries like sorry, uh, SDG diff, SDG info, uh, which is somewhat deprecated in SDG. For the for the for this demo itself, I will use a, a pre-build that is on my path, um, just to you know rely on it a bit. But uh, what we recently also published um, that that might be of interest for other uh, other people to in inspect how SDG actually works is uh, our test suite. Um, the test suite is not yet in a, in a shape that you can just say, make test. We're working on that. Um, mm -hmm. But it's especially um, tricky if you have different compilers and like, like we are not able to handle this properly. We, we know it works well for Clang to just compare expectations against uh, what is there. But um, you can still see what, um, for example, is like how SDG files look for certain C files if you compile them with Clang. So for example, here's a simple C file from the oops, SCC. Here's a simple um, C file that is looking oddly familiar to what we already saw on the slides before. And if I, for example, just like compile that, simple, uh, simple, oh, yeah. And then I go there and extract ABI, um, at some point, we might actually auto detect um, the types. Okay, uh, and then we print it. And you can see this. This is just like directly the extraction, similar to what we saw earlier. Um, and now we can we can see that that this what we just created. Uh, oh, sorry, what did I do? Ah, so I, sorry, I just split it on the com uh, on the. Uh, on the terminal, I can also put it in the in, in the file, and this is textually exactly the same um, as that the one from the test suite. Um, so I can do simple. What you? Oh, that's a 
color scheme is not friendly to me, but I would just swap um, these two members here, for example. And I compile the whole thing again. I extract uh, the, uh, the, the representation and and now I can use SDG div um, and compare this SDG file against uh, the expected one that we just the, basically the same comparison. So if I'm not doing anything, it just gives me a return code. Uh, that's kind of intended, um, but sometimes misleading. But I can also completely spill it on the command line or on the file. Uh, and you can see here now that like, this is quite messy, um, but, but it gives all the detailed information and how, how uh, ch the change came um, into, like, how the change actually um, uh, came, came along. But then we have the formats, uh, one of them being the, uh, the short format that literally just says exactly in line what happened here. Uh, offsets changed for, for this uh, particular member. And then there's the small that has a very similar output, but focuses on different things, saying here that the actual offset changed from, from that to that, taking a bit more into account. Um, now, there's another, I oh, still have some time. Oh, okay. Um, Can you show the protocol text the div? Um, from the div? Or? Yeah. There's, there's no diff from the protobuf, well, but, but there's just take. Right? I, I you can, yeah, I can do the, the diff. Yeah, that, that's that's right. I can do the, the simple, oh, sorry. Diff, simple SDG against the expected um, simple. That's what you want, right? Yeah, right. You yeah. Diff, maybe. I can see like yeah. in this case, um, this member particular changed um, the offset value and that also called because we can, we could technically reuse members across diff, com, entirely different data structures. Um, the stable ID uh, changed, uh, and then the reference down um, um, in the in the actual struct union type also changed um, to just the members. But that that's about it. What changed here in this case? Um, um, no, it's actually not coincidental. <laughs> there's there's some seeding in there. <laughs> yeah, um, but maybe let's let's skip some part. All right, probably got two minutes left for questions. Okay, any questions from the audience? While I'm doing this, I'm just like also processing uh, a VM Linux here. Um, so one thing that you said you have a symbol filter. And this mm -hmm. kind of ties into what you were saying about opaque types. If I'm a user space library, I've got a whole bunch of opaque types that are my interface, mm -hmm. right? If I'm the if I'm libgl, the gl context is going to change its representation, but it's behind an opaque pointer that the the consumer can never tell. Do you have a type filter for that as well? Could you say all objects of this type? I don't care about their changes. I don't care about anything that downstream from them. So. Um... When it, when it comes to how compilers actually encode uh, the type information from that, it really, really depends on whether the type information for that opaque pointer is actually available. So if you think of like foo star uh, being your interface, and um, if it's forward declared, the compiler will likely not have any information about that. Um, well, so from... yet, but but if if you look at the entire, for example, if you look at the entire kernel and the compilation might, unit might uh, omit that type information, mm -hmm. we can actually recover it from from somewhere else, and we are currently doing this. So the type information, if it's available at some point, we try to like feed it into that type. Mm -hmm. So even if the if the change is opaque, um, then it, it could be um, that that this gets flagged as an ABI uh, change. And this is intentional because we want to rather be conserv conservative. But we have um, like recently explored like three approaches of how to actually um, filter this out. Um, one of them is, is a quite quite obvious to understand. If you say okay, if it's if it's defined in a header file, you include the type. If mm -hmm. it's defined in a source file, like a C file, you don't include the type. That that uh, seems to be a quite effective way because. Usually, you would um, like fully specify the type in a header file, right. and and uh, the definition only that if it's private, mm -hmm. uh, and you want to keep it private in the source file. There are other ways of um, uh, like 
discovering this um like there, there are at least two more ways of of being a bit more um, mm. specific on, on understanding how opaque opa types um can be still enriched with type information but this is kind of what we're working on would that be something a compiler attribute might help with if i had a, a type attribute on the declaration that says this is intended to be an opaque type could you please note it in the dwarf so that i can pick this up from my tools downstream Yes, I mean anything that that helps to enrich dwarf or feed into something we can read from the binary. That that's um, that's possible. Yeah. Okay. Get in touch with me, please. I, I like that idea. Right. I think we're we're out of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, round of applause, everyone. Thanks for okay. Sure. I have to disconnect myself. Let me quickly to do that. Just oh, is this your phone? Go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, should I uh, expand this? Uh, they'll do that in the back of the room. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So I, I'm sincere and um, I'm working on uh, speeding up kernel builds with automated header refactoring. So build times are held back significantly by lexing and parsing needless tokens. So when you import something that's unnecessary, you're slowing down your build time and headers tend to grow over time. So this can become problematic very easily. So one of the goals uh, we wanna do is we wanna make it easier to refactor headers because uh, for something like the Linux kernel that's moving fast, it's really painful to just remove a header um, because someone else might write some code that depends on it. And there's also a lot of tooling that's missing and we wanna sort of fill in that gap. So if you see uh, this, this is sort of a diagnosis of what's taking up the most time, right? Uh, you'll see most of the time is spent uh, lexing and parsing. Um, and there's a little bit of semantic analysis and code generation here, but um, most of the time is just dominated by lexer, by the lexer and parser. And this is sort of an issue, right? So when we pre-process the files, uh, they become hundreds of times larger. Um, and that means we'll have millions of extra lines to parse, which is not really great. And it puts a lot of load on the uh, lecture and parser, and it also like bleeds into the other parts of, of the compilation pipeline. And it leads a bigger compiler IR and a lot of other stuff. So th the compiler front end doesn't like sufficiently address the pre-processing bloat. So we want to sort of prevent it from ever like reaching that stage by removing some headers or refactoring some headers. So the motivation for this is uh, Engel Molnar has been reworking the headers of the Linux kernel to build faster. And uh, in some configurations for specific x86 builds, he's gone 50 to 80% improvements in build times, which is great. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, the status of these commits are sort of up in the air. Um, and it's unclear what, uh, it's unclear like how he's, how to automate this. So we want to step in and sort of help with that. And um, that's what this project is going to do because we want it to like, this is a one-off series of changes and we want this to stop being a problem like permanently. So what are the additional be benefits just beyond build times? There's also a reduction in times to bisect and a reduction in times uh, to uh, perform reductions, right? So the tool we're using is called include what you use. It's a tool tr traditionally used for C++, but we're using this on the kernel. So 
it can make indirect includes direct and it can also remove dead includes. So because the Linux kernel is uh, pretty large and organized, it's relatively easy to use it on the kernel. And uh, there are some problems with uh, include what you use them. The problems lie in the fact that not all headers are configure, uh, not all he headers work with all configurations. And the include what you use defaults are sort of like prohibitive, sort of like prevent us from using it out of the box for the Linux kernel. So we have to work around it. So some problems with uh, include what you use type defs like in 6014, they're commonly defined in uh, standard int uh, and the Linux kernel doesn't have a standard int. So when we use include what you use, it recommends that we include a header that doesn't exist and that's problematic. And the reason for that is that it has defaults and these defaults can be changed. So that's something we need to do when using include what you use. Um, so these uh, are accelerator tables and they just map commonly used symbols like in 6014 to standard int IH. So we can actually fix this and make our own include what you use faster by mapping in 6040 to uh, types.h instead. And yeah, so beyond that, there's another problem where if you use a dash i, which the kernel uses very frequently, it converts uh, angle brackets to quotation marks, which is just a stylistic change that's not very good. So one of the problems we run into is um, asm versus asm generic. When we convert all includes uh, all indirect includes to direct includes, that means we pull in ASM generics. And uh, generally you can have ASM generic string 64T, which is like, it, it won't work with ARM, for example. So instead what we can do is we can tell include what you use. If you're gonna pull in this header, uh, don't, uh, just pull in this secondary header instead. So if uh, string pulls in string 64.T, it, it will just say, just pull in string and stop at, at that. And this can be sort of done uh, programmatically if we uh, if we uh, use uh, k-build uh, or arch k-build. And this is something we're still experimenting with. So another problem with include what you use is macros. Uh, include what you use is notoriously pretty bad with macros. Um, and it doesn't know when macros are called, so it sometimes just rips them out entirely. Uh, that's not great because the Linux kernel uses macros all the time. And um, another problem is sometimes the kernel declares duplicate headers. Uh, that is intentional and it gets removed by include what you use. Uh, this is called an extra macro. Um, and dealing with these sort of requires some manual effort, but it can be assisted in one way, which is including uh, include what you use pragmas. This is what is traditionally used. Uh, maybe we don't want to use this in the kernel though. So that that's, uh, we, we've come up with ways to avoid that. And another thing is token pacing identifiers makes analysis tricky. So how are we going to deal with the fact that it sometimes just rips out macros and it deduplicates headers? Um, well, just as they have inclusion, inclusion tables, they also have symbol tables. So the purpose of a symbol table is to say, if you have this specific symbol, you're going to call this specific header. And this has made it so that whenever we see a macro, uh, it doesn't rip it out entirely. And that's great because it allows us to sort of fix more files. Because if we didn't have this, we would sort of have to just skip over files that have macros because more often than not, they just get removed entirely. Uh, the problem with this is that it's slightly time consuming to create and they need to be kept in sync with the kernel version. Uh, for example, if you move something out of a symbol table or if you move something out of a header or have it uh, multiple times, it could be pro uh, problematic. Uh, so that is a concern with this. Uh, but some statistics, because we have run this and it has worked for the most part. So for string.o, for example, um, libstring.o, uh, when we pre-process it without our header changes, it has 24,000 lines of code. And after pre-processing it, it has 
five thousand lines of code. Sorry, that's after running include what you use. Oh yeah, after running include what you use and then pre-processing it, it has uh, seventy-eight percent less stuff. So before uh, include what you use, build time is 0.36 seconds. After include what you use, it's 0.12 seconds. And this is like a very significant speed up. Um, this isn't, this is like a pretty large speed up compared to some other files. Some other files will cut down in, by a smaller amounts, but this is still a significant speed up. And when using an automated include what you use script, uh, what we found is uh, it didn't change anything except for a warn on, which is which was it just said there was a warning on this line number. The line number just changed because there were fewer headers, uh, so the line moved up. So uh, our progress so far. Uh, th these numbers are for a machine with 128 cores uh, and an x86 def config. Uh, the def config all build takes roughly 72.3 seconds. Uh, after changes to around 220 files, we, we only looked at 300 and we managed to change to 20 automatically. Um, we managed to get down to exactly 69 seconds and there's 2,700 files. So we've looked at roughly one ninth of it. So there's definitely a lot more of a speed up to be obtained. And this is also only for one, uh, for one uh, configuration. So there's still a lot of stuff to remove. And, um, Overall, we've removed over a million lines of uh, code from pre-processing. So another thing we've looked into is pre-compiled headers. So these can speed up build times and they're used pretty frequently in C++. And uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, use this on the most frequently included um, headers. So some candidates are compiler types.h, kconfig.h and compiler version.h. These are used all the time and these are forcibly injected into every translation unit using a dash include if you analyze compile commands.json. Um, so yeah, problem we run into sort of when including uh, PCH, uh, pre-compiled headers, uh, is there's it's sensitive to um, the flags it's very sensitive to the flags. And there are often headers that are used in both the host utilities and the um, target machine. So what happens is you're going to have to delete the header or create two versions of the pre-compiled header because once you create it once, you're gonna have to recompile the host utilities um, or you're going to have, the, the next time you uh, build, you're going to have to rebuild the host utilities. So that is a concern. So we're uh, currently seeing if it's worth doing and what the potential speed ups would be. And as for future research, uh, we're trying to automatically break up headers because before we were changing the include list of C files, which is good and it can provide changes um, and it has provided changes, but the origin of the issues are really in the headers. Uh, let, let's imagine everything was in just one giant header that would be pretty problematic, right? There's no way to change that easily with include what you use. So um, we can do, we can fix this with sort of static analysis um, and sort of given an identifier, what are the uses, right? So what we have done is we can, for a specific header, we can construct a fully connected graph and uh, the weights in between each, ed in between a no two nodes would be how frequently they appear in the same file across configuration. And from this, we can use a graph partitioning algorithm here. We used hierarchical agglomeration. So we can just essentially break the fully connected uh, graph into two parts. Um, here, uh, you can see that most of the um, tokens that we uh, put into the green side are um, integers. So this might suggest that we want to break up types.h into a uh, standard int.h as well. And uh, Nick can handle this. Sure. Uh, yeah, so um, there's some other things beyond just automated header refactoring around kind of trying to speed up the build further. So right now, 
Tanzir is doing research and just seeing like, can we apply include what you use to make indirect includes direct and dead includes removed? Um, can we use pre-compiled headers either for frequently reused headers or headers that get included often? Um, and then finally, how can we decide where to split headers? Um, so from there, the additional things that we kind of need. Um, so we have some tooling for LLVM that lets us, like given a compiler IR file and a symbol, that's usually a function, it will extract. Um, so if you have compiler IR, that's like a, a million lines of code. And you say, I just want this function definition. Pull this out, please. It can pull out just that function definition for you. And then you can say like recursively pull out the definitions of the things it calls. Um, we don't have anything like that for C. And that would be nice because when I decide, like we have some policy first of where we're going to make like split a header. We don't have any tooling to say like given this .h file, create a second .h file for me and copy over the definition. Like that, that would be nice to try to automate some stuff. Um, and then some other things going on. There's a lot of work going on right now in the kbuild tree around mod post and improving build times because that's a pretty large serialization step in the build. And so, for instance, there was like a commit within the latest release. I think that just got merged into 6.7, um, but it actually shaves minutes off of all yes config builds. Uh, I think there's more to be done there because I still think it's single threaded. And I think maybe we can start to add some parallelism to mod posts. I don't know. Um, but really kind of the, the feedback we're looking from folks here at Plumbers today is what else do we need to build? And so like a common thing that we've had as well is or heard from kernel developers is that we have some issues with some headers where some types, I guess, where in order to reference the type properly, like this header needs like two headers need to be included in a certain order or vice versa kind of thing. Um, so we're kind of curious what other thoughts folks have, because I don't think this problem is very spe specific to the kernel, but in general, C doesn't have a whole lot of tooling for this. Maybe I'm unaware of something though, but do folks have ideas? So I build the perf tool a lot, and uh, an obscure thing in the perf tool is that we have the um, the include Linux stuff is copied into the tools directory, as is the UAPI stuff, but the Linux stuff comes first on the dash, dash i uh, things before the UAPI one. So what that means is that Linux types.h has got priority over the UAPI types.h, which is kind of weird for a user mode program. Uh, and we run into all kinds of conflicts because you know, you, you include like something from the Linux types.h and then you include stud.io.h, which somewhere down there gets into an asm generic types.h. Um, why is everything called types.h? So it's a, <laughs> we have core.c and types.h. We have two file names and we'll use them everywhere. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's. <clears throat> I, I I feel like we sometimes we're our own worst enemy, and kind of like by naming every file the same name, it's like, but why? Um, but was there a re request in there, Ian? Yeah, yeah. Can we rename <laughs> things and not not call everything types of Yeah, so I think like part of the issue with renaming stuff is just like you can you can be certain that at this point in time for my tree right now it builds. And then someone's pull request beats you to Linus, where they depend on the thing that you just renamed. And oops. And that's that's going to be tricky no matter what for this problem. So from my understanding here of include what you use, it's automatically telling you what to include and so on. I think one of the big problems I've looked at, uh, because reviewing Ingo's thing that was mentioned before, is that we have a few places that are just super connected nodes, like kernel.h and shed.h, just including tons, that has tons of fan out fan in and it's used everywhere so there's tons of fan out so having some tooling to analyze that fan in and fan out would be really helpful for saying actually this header gets included everywhere or it's including everything regardless of how you want to partition it knowing what that scaling factor is on either side gives you a good idea of if we cut that what the benefit would be so that, that would be really nice yeah so one of the things we did was uh so we have hierarchical agglomeration so basically what it does is it goes to a specific header and it ch checks basically what's the impact of each token, right? So if it's included everywhere, we're gonna see that in this. Uh, sure, I'm, I'm just asking for a different oh, granularity. I can distinguish. So I think um, just expanding on Mark's point, 
So like this is taking a look at one .h file at a time and deciding like, okay, we might, but Mark's question is how do you identify which .h file do you look at first? And and so Arnd has, I think Arnd has shown tooling where he's able to generate graphs of that fan in, fan out. And so I think that's something where we can look at to see how strongly connected is this node. Okay, now that we've identified which .h file we're going to start with breaking up, then you move on to this, which decides how do I split it. And you, you basically, basically this technique is using correlation between of all the symbols in the header, um, who's using them. Sure, I, I guess from my perspective, I'm not sure this is like, I'm not sure that this is necessarily the the level of detail we actually want to analyze this with, because you can certainly do analysis with this. But for most things, the fan out and the fan in, I think are gonna dominate. And also like one of the big reasons we have unnecessary fan in and fan out is headers that mix like structure definitions and code. Because we've got, because that, that's the big problem with kernel.h and shed.h, right? Shed.h pulls in absolutely everything because it needs to put a bunch of structures in task struct. And while including all of those headers for those like structs that it's embedding, it also goes and pulls in function definitions that ends up pulling in other files and so on. Whereas like, if we have, sorry, in static, like, whereas if we had, for example, um, an idiom where we said, when you have thing, you have a foo types.h and a foo.h and your foo types.h should have the bare minimum includes necessary to put this structure in something. Actually, I suspect that would have a big benefit and that would, I wouldn't necessarily get all the benefit of what Ingo has on in history, but I suspect it would get a quite substantial portion of that quite easily. And then if we had the ability to analyze the fan in and fan out, it would make it much easier to say, we should definitely do that to this thing over here. And I suspect we could get very close, very quickly without having to go into this level of fine granularity. And therefore that would be an easier thing to tell people to do. No other points, Andrew? Um, mainly as the, so the thing is that the, um, the, fu the function declarations themselves are, are fine. It's the static inlines that have full code in them that are far more expensive. They're also the ones that tend to make it quite complicated to refactor headers because they're just regular bits of C. You've got to have all, you've got to have the internals of the structures and all the functions uh, done ahead of that. So even splitting static inlines out into somewhere else um, would uh, fi figuring out how to move those sideways again would make a lot of flexibility improvements. Is is forward declaration evil in this world view? Um, I don't think so. I think I think we. There's, there's an option to allow forward declaration and to not allow forward declaration. We've, we've turned on the option that allows forward declaration because we don't want to like fundamentally change too many people's code. So, yeah. Guessing the previous talk on ABI analysis had a point on opaque types. Maybe they would frown upon it. Unclear yet. Haven't sent patches yet. So until we do and someone says, no, no, I don't like this. Then we'll maybe be forced to have that discussion, but we haven't been forced to have that discussion quite yet, I think. <laughs> sure. Um, is there any talk to adding any of these checks in mainline kernel? I mean, you don't necessarily need to add like your full tooling, but you know, something that maintainers or someone who's writing more code can say, oh, you know, there's some low hanging fruit that we can take care of before pushing. Yeah, so the, the end goal would be to have this maybe not in mainline or maybe even in mainline, but we want this to be a tool that not just us, but other developers can use to sort of analyze this uh, and on their own and prevent any problems. Yeah. Right. Covered by something you said earlier, but in a few places we have like definitions in one header and there are comments at the top saying, absolutely do not include this header, include this other header that wraps it. Yeah. Um, do we have the right annotations to be able to handle that with this tool? Yeah, so they're basically, the way we can deal with this, um, I ran into this a few times. So the way you can deal with this is using the inclusion tables and saying, if you're about to include this one, stop and include the other thing instead. Um, that has worked for the most part, so we haven't run into that issue. Yeah. Um, 
Cool. All right. If that's no more questions, I don't want to block uh, fo hungry folks heading to lunch. So let's give Tanzir a round of applause. All right. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back here after lunch. Does anyone know what time that is precisely? 2.30. All right. We'll be back here at 2.30. Cool. Good job, buddy. Yeah. It's my VX also super fun to play with. It. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just even seeing this graph for the first time, I was like, that's looking a lot yeah. like stood in to me, you know, and then these are like kernel specific, ah, whatever. But like, you know, very clearly you start to see like, you know, how how should I split my header? But are you actually splitting them? Um, no, no, this doesn't split yet. This tells you how to split. Yeah, yeah you, but you plan to split. Yeah, we plan to split. How do you so, plan to, to handle yeah, like those yeah, mid file group includes which are actually necessary to talk about particular places? Yeah, so we, we, we've seen that before and uh, you know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, I think like this, the secret processor is its own worst enemy, right? Of like, you know, you can pound to find something and then the whole rest of the file is interpreted differently, right? Yeah. And like that, that kind of stuff is going to be tricky. Hey, what's. Where it goes. Oh, yeah. So, that is Oh, no, no. It just splits into you. So, this is all. Oh, they probably need to